so I'm more human? Is that what you're trying? Superhuman. Um, my name is Michael. If we haven't met, I'm the Southfield lead pastor. I'm excited to be with you this morning. Uh, we are um, in the middle of our Together series. We're kind of taking a short three-week pause to share some stories in between. And I'm really excited about this because God is moving. And I love when we get to share and celebrate where he's moving at. And I love uh, one of the scriptures in John chapter 20, verse 30. It says this, the disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, he is the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. And so I just love, there's so much power in the the name of Jesus, there's so much power in the stories of God at work within his people. And uh, that's how God, he works. He works in the hearts of his people. He transforms lives, and then he has those transformed lives transform other lives. And so I just love that we get to share um, a couple of stories in the next couple of weeks of just where God is moving. Um, and And I love the imagery of seeing uh, stories lived out. I think that's why I connect with Jesus, and I think many of us connect with Jesus so well, is because he's the visible image of an invisible God. When we see Jesus, we see the Father. When we know Jesus, we know the Father. And so I love the stories that interact with, with Jesus moving and transforming people's lives. And so we're gonna jump into a story um, in Luke 19, I'd love to read. It'll be on the screen behind me if you do not have a Bible. But let's jump in. Luke 19, verse 1 says this. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. Now there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in this region. And I want to hit pause there for a moment, uh, bring some context, because a tax collector may not seem like that big a deal to you or me. But this is a huge deal. So this is a, uh, a, um, a Jewish... Uh, town, and it's occupied by the Roman Empire. So the Romans are ruling over the Jewish people. And Zacchaeus, he is a Jew, and he has decided to align himself with the Romans and take money from his fellow uh, Jews to give to the Romans as a tax. But not just that, he actually exploited the situation. He would take more than was required, and he would line his own pockets with it. And so he was despised by his, his fellow Jewish people. He was despised because he was working for the enemy, and he was basically making a, a horrible situation of being occupied by a foreign country, foreign people, make it even worse by teaming up with them and taking our money and uh, making yourself rich. So that's kind of the context. And he was the chief tax collector. So he was kind of like the mob boss of this region. He ran a whole bunch of little tax collectors. So he was pretty high up in this thing. And so he was not well liked. And so Zacchaeus, he was the chief tax collector in this region. And he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So Zacchaeus was a a short mob boss. And he ran, so he ran and climbed a sycamore fig tree uh, that was beside the road, for he knew that Jesus was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came by, Jesus looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Well, Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus into his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He has gone to be a guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half of my wealth to the poor. And Lord, and if I have have cheated people of their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. And Jesus responded by saying this, salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the son of man, Jesus, came to seek and save those who are lost. And so, Jesus came to seek and save those who are lost. We as a church, we exist to reach this world for Jesus one person at a time. And we do that by helping people who are far from God come to know him, experience him, uh, give their lives to him, start to follow him, experience life transformation, and help them grow so that they can help others do the same. That's how we do this. We reach the world for Jesus one person at a time. 
And that's why God came. That's why he sent his son Jesus, and we're on this mission with him. And uh, if we're going to be Jesus' church, we want to see lost people come home, dead people be raised to life in him. And uh, if we hadn't seen, uh, haven't been seeing baptisms like 132 so far this year, I would question, are we Jesus' church? Because his church is all about seeking and saving the lost. Or are we just about our church who just likes to hang out in this, in this Seventh-day Adventist building and hang out with each other? You know, which church do we want to be? His church or some pale comparison one that's our church, but it's comfortable for us? And so what I love about this story is uh, Jesus noticed Zacchaeus. I love it. Jesus was walking through the city. He wasn't heading there to meet with Zacchaeus. He was walking through it. And he saw that Zacchaeus was hungry to see him, that Zacchaeus climbed a tree. And what I love about this interaction is that Jesus knew him. Jesus knew his name. Did you catch that? He said Zacchaeus. And it makes me think of, of us in this room. Jesus sees you wherever you're at. God sees you. God sees you and he knows your name. And he wants to invite himself to be with you. And I love that Zacchaeus uh, was so excited to have Jesus come stay with him. With excitement and joy, he opened his home. But what happened to everybody else? They got pretty bent out of shape, right? They said, oh, Jesus is hanging out with sinners? Jesus is hanging out with sinners? That's not cool. That's not, that's not right. But I love that Jesus clarified at the end of that. No, I came to seek and save the lost. Those who are hurting, those who are broken, that's why I'm here. And for us to see that Jesus declared that in this moment, when Zacchaeus had a present, he was in the presence of Jesus, his life radically transformed, so much so that Jesus said, in this moment, salvation has come to this house. Zacchaeus met with Jesus, interacted with him, and had his life radically transformed, so much so that he turned from his old life. I'll give half of my wealth away to the poor. And anyone I've cheated, I will pay them back four times as much. So there was this turn from his old life to a new way of following Jesus. And I love that salvation has come, and Jesus declared his intent of why he came. He says, for the Son of Man came to seek and save those who were lost. To seek and save those who were lost. And so my question is, is Jesus still doing that today? Is Jesus still in the business of seeking and saving those who are lost? Those who are notorious sinners like Zacchaeus? Or is he only looking for people who have cleaned themselves up enough to be worthy of his love? That's a question we have to ask. Do you believe that Jesus truly came to seek and save those who are lost and broken? And if he did, are we a church that's, that welcomes people who are, are in process, who are still trying to wrestle through what it means to, to give their life to Jesus? Some people who are still lost and broken, are, you, are they okay to come in this, in this room and be with us? We have to, to know that man, God is still in the business of seeking and saving the lost. And in this story series, I was going to share my story, but then I, I thought I've shared my story in bits and pieces enough. And a lot of times when pastors share about their story, their testimony of how God's radically transformed them. I remember sitting in a, in a chair going, yeah, but you're a pastor. God has to do that in your life. I'm not like you. I'm not a super Christian. I don't do all the things that you do. So it's different. And so this series, I wanted to bring um, people up who are sitting next to you, who are doing life with you. They're in groups with you. They're serving alongside of you you would view them as like you. They're just people just like you. And so I wanted to bring a couple of those people up uh, today to share their story with you of, of God still doing this. God is still seeking and saving the lost. He is still uh, calling orphans into his family. And so with that, I'd love to invite my friend Gabby West up. You can welcome Gabby as she comes. How are you doing the second service? <laughs> there, there are more, but again, just like the first service, they're more nervous than you are. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's true. I know. It, I, it, I thought it'd get better. It's not. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's about the same. Um, <laughs> but what, what I love uh, about, about this is that um, God's going to move just as powerfully as he did the first service. And um, we're in this together. We're, we're a family. 
And uh, so to kind of loosen up a little bit, how long have you been a part of the Real Life family? Um, about almost three years now. And so you started on the north side? Yes, started on the north side and then was here for the launch here and have been here ever since. Awesome. Um, what should we do? What else should we do? <laughs> should we imagine them as something? Yeah. I like to imagine them in parkas. <laughs> I think I was sharing that with you before. Like yeah. people say, imagine them in their underwear. That just scares me out and freaks me out. <laughs> I imagine people fully clothed, yeah. like awkwardly <laughs> fully clothed. You know, it just kind of, uh, it breaks the ice a little bit. They're all like goofy. It's like hot in here and they're wearing these parkas. They can't put their arms down. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So um, with, with that, uh, I would love, it's funny because we're both socially <laughs> <I> awkward, <know. laughs> but we both have microphones. I know. So, here we are. <laughs> uh, um, I would love if you'd be willing to share uh, parts of your story with us this morning. I will just start from the beginning. <laughs> um, the first 19 years of my life, I lived in a very isolated environment. That meant no after-school sports, no slumber parties, no um, birthday parties, um, you name it. I was allowed, though, to have people over at my house. I never utilized that because I did not want people to see what I lived in or what I had to live with. I was sexually abused by my father at the age of five and at the age of 13. I was physically, mentally, and emotionally abused daily. My mother would turn a blind eye to that. So I felt alone and scared and broken. So my safe place was my bed. <laughs> I would curl up in the corner at the top with my pillow and just cry. When a child is abused or criticized, they don't stop loving the parent. They, st they stop loving themselves. So when I was 19, I gathered enough courage, and I moved out on my own. And it's, I'm a visual person, so I have to put this in a visual. I, it was like taking a caged animal that has been beaten and broken all of its life and then putting it out in the wild and releasing it. And I was terrified. If you don't know much about this world, like I didn't, it can be brutal. So about a decade of a lot of broken chapters, more different chapters, I could tell you about someday. I um, eventually, I was, I was in college, and I was in class, and I had a friend sitting next to me, and she asked me if I wanted to hang out on a Sunday, and I was like, okay, and she goes, okay, let's go for coffee, but I have to go to church service first, so do you just want to tag along? <laughs> and I'm like, okay, and I went, and it was a big room, lots of people, and I remember the pastor was speaking, and at the time, he was speaking on exactly the broken chapters I was on in that time in my life. And I felt like God was speaking through him to me. And out of nowhere, I just felt this overwhelming flood of emotion. And I knew it was love. For the first time in my life, I felt pure, unconditional, sweet love. And my friend next to me, and I started sobbing. I was just crying. <laughs> And my friend next to me obviously just sees me burst out in tears. I'm bawling. And she's just like, um, <laughs> you okay? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, tears of joy. And a few weeks later, because this was at a different church at the time, I was baptized. And after I was baptized, I really wanted to know more about this Jesus guy that made me feel the way that I did. And I learned so I learned how to pray. I learned that there were new and different Bible translations that I didn't know about, so there was one that really I could understand and cling to. And then growing up in an environment the way that I did, it makes me a very curious and very, like, I question everything individual, and I'm super socially awkward. So I would pick out, like, conversations around me, uh, like, 
hearing about Jesus here and there, and I would just go and ask so many questions. And I remember this one time I would sneeze, like I sneeze at you, and then <laughs> this person goes, God bless you, and I'm like, do you know Jesus? <laughs> I'm still that socially awkward. And um, I, in that, I ended up developing this, this environment, not knowing it, I was developing this environment around me where I was surrounded by godly people. And it, it, I knew, I know now it was God working through those people to reach me, to, to fill me up and to feed me. And when you come to know the Lord, you don't stop having storms in your life. But the best part of it is you get to go through them with him. And I remember recently I was going through um, some health issues. I had a kidney, recurrent kidney infection, and I also had some court issues going on with my son's father. And I had all this going on, and I felt God say, okay, you've developed your relationship enough so far in me that you're strong enough. Let's write a letter to your parents. And I'm like, no. <laughs> but I did. And I stayed obedient to him through all my storms and stayed obedient, wrote the letter, mailed it off with the, with the goal to have a relationship with my parents in a new and loving way with the Lord. It was full of forgiveness and pointing towards the Lord and with new healthy boundaries, I wanted to continue a relationship with them. I did not get the answer that I wanted. I was rejected again. But in that, God did something so amazing. He broke so many chains inside of me and wiped away all that past. And I lost a family that day, but I gained a new one. It's all of you, every single one of you in this room. It's my husband who takes all those broken pieces from my past and he loves them very much. I have four beautiful children. I also found out that I have a father. I had a father this whole time. He's not going to hurt me. He's not going to neglect me. And he's holding that five-year-old little girl inside of me. And he's saying, you'll no longer be alone. So in that, <laughs> I'm super introverted, very socially awkward, see? <laughs> and, um, but in that, I have to step out of my comfort zone because there are people that have gone through things that I've gone through and they need to know Jesus. They need to know his love because it's amazing. So in doing that, <laughs> stepping out of my comfort zone, I am leading two groups, one with my husband, Tuesday nights, one online group for women, to pull out the other introverts like myself out of the internet. And I attend church regularly. My husband and I both tithe. I'm intentional about my relationships. And I have a Facebook page where I created where people can just love on each other, just pour out God's love on each other, encourage and build up. And it, this is a family. All of us are a family. And in that encouragement, I just want to give a quick example of just being a family member. Um, one of our worship pastors, uh, or worship leaders, uh, Samuel, I asked him, how are you, before I got up here, because like I said, I'm totally introverted. Um, I asked him, how are you so confident on stage? And he goes, well, let me ask you this. What are you most afraid of? And I said, presenting my broken pieces and having someone break them even more. And he said, well, let me put it to you this way. What if you knew for a fact you shared your story and someone came to know Jesus, but you also knew for a fact you would get hurt in the process as well? Would you still do it? I said, absolutely. Because there's other little five-year-old girls like myself or other people that need to know his love, and I'm ready to risk that. So, since we're all a family, if I have not met you, I need to. 
My name's Gabby. Thank you. So I have, a, I have a question for you. Do it. <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm sitting here listening to you and I'm, maybe my past isn't exactly like yours, but I'm dealing with some brokenness and maybe um, some past shame or all that stuff, mm-hmm. what would your encouragement be to me today? My encouragement would be there is, there is a father and he loves you. He loves you. He knows you. He sees you. He knows every bit of you, and he loves you so much, and he made you a masterpiece. And he wants to use you to reach others that are just like you. That's good. What about fear is a big thing in our, in our, in our lives, and fear can keep us from doing the things that God has asked us to do. Yeah. Um, you are overcoming some fear, you're taking steps of faith. Um, how, how are you doing that? Well, I um, forgot to mention this in the first service too. <laughs> um, those broken, those um, storms that I was going through, when I stayed obedient to the Lord, he moved all my mountains within a matter of two days. So all my he- health issues, all the core issues, the stuff inside of me from all built up from my past he wiped all those away. He moved all my mountains in a matter of two days just because I was obedient and I put my faith in him. So that helps encourage me to move on, but also the fact that there's other people out there. I'm not, I'm not the only one with a broken story, a broken past, that fly. Um, but I, I want to reach out. If there is a five-year-old little girl or somebody that feels that broken inside that's like that five-year-old little girl, and I want to pull them out of that dark, lonely place and let them know they're not alone, Mm -hmm. God loves them. So that gives me the encouragement to step out. Yes, I am extremely introverted. Yes, I am socially awkward. But I have to make a conscious effort each day to say, no, I'm not going to stay in my little comfort zone. I'm going to step out and try to help somebody know Jesus. Awesome. Can we thank Gabby? (laughs) Man, I I love, I love hearing a story of God moving in someone's life so much so that um, it's, you know, Gabby just didn't receive God's love and go, thank you. Now my my life is in a better place. I now know you awesome and just kind of sit in it. I love that her response to receiving God's love and that grace and that overwhelming feeling is motivating her. It's moving her to help others experience that same love, that same grace, that same forgiveness and, um, and redemption and, and restoration that she's experiencing. She is pushing through uh, her her limitations, her introvertedness, her awkwardness to make sure that, man, everyone knows that God loves them and, and, and God has a plan for them. And God is rewriting uh, her story. And um, I just, I love that. And I want to, I want to share another story with you. This is of Tyson West. This is Gabby's husband. And I'd love for us to watch uh, this story on the screen with me. Well, I grew up in uh, the small town of Palouse. My family owned a grocery store in town, um, but I had access to the beer cooler. Uh, once I started drinking, I thought, wow, this is the good stuff. Uh, what it did to me, the, the feeling that it gave me inside, I thought, wow, this is, this is good, this is life. I had no idea, I didn't know who Jesus was, but I did know that, um, that I enjoyed that intoxication. And you know, you fast forward 20 years, and uh, now it's progressed to uh, different substances, um, marijuana and psychedelics and, and then meth and heroin. So really, I was just kept pursuing that feeling. I wanted that, that good feeling. And uh, you know, I, realized this, I realized that this wasn't really working out. Things started, started to um, 
fall apart. It was, uh, my family started noticing that uh, you know my health was deteriorating, and I'm getting in legal trouble. And and I had a I had a son out of wedlock, and and uh, so I wasn't really in his life. And and altogether, I've had 30 criminal charges throughout my substance abuse um, uh, portion of my life. So I tried to go to treatment numerous times. All together, actually 14 times, and I get some clean and sober time, and I'd be doing I'd be doing pretty good, and uh, getting back in my son's life and working and paying child support and and getting on my feet, but but then I'd always fall back in. I'd I'd, I'd succumb back to that temptation. You know, the problem was I just I didn't have the power to overcome that. It took me to some pretty dark places, really. Uh, it took me to an attempted suicide where I stabbed myself in the neck those times. It took me to homelessness. It took me to um, living on the streets where, to the point where uh, all I'm living for is that next fix. March of 2011, I got picked up on a criminal charge. It was a felony charge, possession of a stolen motor vehicle. Now this is my second felony. And part of me was relieved because I was like, okay, I can't run anymore. This, okay. I'm gonna go down for a while because I had a previous felony. I mean, you go through booking in Spokane County, you you go through, um, you get fingerprinted, then you go up these stairs and you grab your bedroll and you go upstairs and you walk past this bookshelf and you grab your roll of toilet paper and your toothbrush and uh, but sometimes there's books on the shelf, most of the time there aren't. And there was one book and it was a New Testament and it was a NLT version, it was a study Bible, How to Find God. And I thought, you know what? Nothing else has worked. Nothing else has worked. Treatment numerous times. I mean, why not? And so I, so I grabbed the Bible and I detoxed from jail. And then I started reading it, and it was a study Bible. And it helped me to understand God's original plan. And it helped me to understand how a sin entered the world and how, um, because of that sin, that's that's why I was in this brokenness and this bondage that I was in. And. God has created us to, have to find our fulfillment in Him, and I was seeking fulfillment in all these things, these things of the world, and the high, and the party lifestyle, and all those things. I was seeking fulfillment, and it just was never enough. That He, and he wants us to have a relationship with Him, and that He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, uh, as Savior to atone for my sins so that I can be forgiven, and so that I can be restored in a right relationship with Him. And so I said yes. I said yes to Jesus in jail. You know, I've picked up the Bible numerous times. I'm like, okay, where do I start? I mean, I didn't get it, you know. Finally, it's starting to make sense, and it's coming to life in me, and I'm feeling this, this peace, and I'm feeling this, this joy. And I'm writing home, yeah, I'm a Christian now, and my family, they saw me go through recovery numerous times, and they're like, yeah, okay, we'll wait, you know. We'll believe it when we see it. And I got out, and immediately the first thing I did was I bummed a cigarette from the first person I saw. And then I walked to the convenience store, and I panhandled, and I bought a beer. And then I went to Dope Man's house, and, and then I uh, asked for a front, hey, look how good I'm looking, can you front me something? So just like that, I was right back to what I knew. And, but this time, now I have this conviction in me, now I have the Holy Spirit in me, like, what am I doing? What, are you, you know, what, what am I doing? I felt filthy. Like, I was, when I was locked up in jail, growing in my relationship with the Lord, learning about Jesus, I was more free there than I am out here doing what I think is freedom, you know, doing whatever I want. And so I needed to go to, I needed help. I needed to go to a recovery program. And so that's what I needed. I went through that program of Adult and Teen Challenge, and uh, it's a year-long program. Lord, and I realized about 10 months into the year-long program, I realized, and I was thankful, God is he's delivering me and saving me from all these things, from drug addiction, from bondage, from sin, from, right, from death, all these things. He's saving me from these things. But I realized 10 months in this program, wait a minute, he's saving me for something. He's saving me to to be a part of, of what he is doing. And, and his, what he wants to do is he wants to reconcile broken people made in the image of God back to himself. And he wants to use us, he wants to use the church, his people to do that. And never in a million years did I think, when I, okay, never in a million years did I think that, uh, you know, when I was playing football, MVP of my, my football team my senior year, never in a million years did I think I'd be eating out of garbage cans and shooting up dope. But when I was in that guy, when I was that guy eating out of garbage cans, never in a million years did I think that I'd be executive director of a faith-based residential recovery program. You know, and that's all, that that is the that's the power of God. Well, I, I just pray that uh, you know, like that God uses this, that this my story reaches somebody and and gives them hope, 
or draws them closer or puts a hunger in them, you know, or a thirst for, for the Lord. That's, you know, that's my hope. Because it's not about my, it's not about me, you know. Yeah. It's about Jesus intervening. Because if he didn't intervene in my story, it would be a tragedy. Isn't it amazing to, to hear a story of God moving? Real life, God is still in this, this mission of seeking and saving the lost. He is still about helping those who are far from him come to know him, experience life transformation, and join him on his mission. I love both of these stories. Both of these, these individuals, Tyson and Gabby, their salvation, their, their receiving of God's love, his grace and mercy was not the end of the game for them. For them, it was the beginning. They both realized that God has saved them, brought them from where they were to where they are now so that he can do a work through them, so he can reach the world around them for him. We talked about it last week with our Together series. Jesus pursues people through his disciples. Jesus wants to use your story. If you have said yes to Jesus and are following him, he wants to use your story to help those around him come to know him. Maybe you have a lot of broken pieces that God wants you to share with those around you because you have hope now and people who are still dealing with those brokenness, they don't have the same hope as you. Maybe your story isn't full of brokenness, but full of God's saving you from all of this stuff. Maybe you grew up in a home that was loving, that honored God. People need to experience that, that, man, here's the story of what God has done in my life. He has saved me from these things. Because sometimes we hear these stories and we get guilty. We feel guilty. Well, my life wasn't as bad as that. So I can't really relate. I can't share my faith, my story with somebody because I don't have a big, man, I was a wreck over here and now God's done this. I grew up knowing God. Well, then share that story. Share that hope that God saved you from the, the traps of this world because he loves you. God wants to do a work in you and through you, real life, to reach this world for him one person at a time. I want us to stand as we respond. So we're gonna close this, this morning out. And I want to ask you, who is that one person in your life that God is asking you to pray for, that your heart is breaking because they don't know Jesus, they don't know the hope, the love, the grace that you know? I would ask that you would pray for them by name, and I would ask that you would ask God, what is your step in that process? Maybe God's leading you to share your story with them, your story of hope, your story of redemption, your story of a God seeing you, loving you, and bringing you into his family. Maybe you're in this room and you, you're at a place where you go, I need salvation. If, if Jesus is real, and he does see me, and he does know me, and he, and he, can, he can receive me, I want to invite you to put your faith in him, to say yes to Jesus, to start following him with your life. Like Zacchaeus, turn from your old life and follow him. And if that's where you're at today, we have a team in the back that would love to pray with you and help you take your next step, which is to be baptized, which is an outward expression. Your old life is being buried under the water. You come out a new creation, the Bible says. And we want to celebrate with you and walk with you and help you grow into the, the son, the daughter that God has called and created you to be. Also, we're going to respond with worship, declaring who God is, thanking him for his love for us. We're also going to have a team, I'm going to invite a team up forward now who, if you need prayer for anything, they would love to partner with you, to pray with you and for you, to see God do a work in you and through you. Let me pray as we respond. God, I thank you so much that you are still alive and active. God, that the stories from the Bible are still happening. And I'm thankful that last week we, we read that greater things are, are we going to see because you have sent your spirit, your Holy Spirit. And God, so we ask that you would fill us up with courage to trust you, to follow you, to share what you've done in our life. God, it's not our story that we're lifting up. It's your story. It's how you have come to seek and save those who were lost. So God, we honor you. We ask that you would reach this world through us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're getting baptized, head to the back. The rest of us are gonna worship. If you need prayer, come forward.